I'm going to be talking today about phylogenetics, one of the most, um, and I would argue, uh, one of the major ways we look at um, uh, genomes, microbial genomes, when we're doing genomic epidemiology. This is going to be sort of a crash course uh, introduction, and later we're going to have a phylodynamics section. Um, I'd like to start, though, with uh, acknowledging where I'm coming from. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University on the unceded traditional territories of Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Um, just beautiful uh, lands here. It's a very nice sunny day here today. And um, I just, uh, I really uh, welcome you to check out these lands and say that um, at Simon Fraser, we're really enjoying doing more integrative data analyses with an evolutionary slant, hence, you know, my interest in phylogenetics. Uh, I'm going to uh, first mention um, something regarding the last module. I can't emphasize enough contextual data organization is important. I just stuck these slides in as a little extra thing, and I promise after this is over, I will give you a slide deck that also has the sort of Slido answers as well. Uh, but um, just a, I wanted to add a cautionary note about using ChatGPT and other large language models for curation. Like it's, it's some people are. Um, using it successfully now uh, when they train it on suitable data, ideally using this RAG, what we call retrieval augmented generation. I won't get into that, but I do want to just caution that it still has issues with reasoning and logic errors, but, and actually is like, um, I like the best description I heard. It's like a cocky third year medical student is ill. It'll know a lot, but it'll very confidently say something wrong. And so um, I asked ChatGPT to make a picture of a cocky third year medical student, and this is what it came up with. But uh, basically, in short, um, a cautionary note, but also some positivity about this. Uh, you know, the the contextual data organization that we've done, we have, um, for example, curated um, and organized data about reasons for medication use, looking at kids who took um, an antibiotic for a viral infection versus a bacterial infection and found insights into uh, reasons why they might be taking a antibiotic for a viral infection. So you can get very powerful insights from organizing data uh, properly. Okay, but today we're gonna flick over back to trees, all about trees. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the fundamentals of character-based evolutionary analysis and phylogenetic analysis, uh, talk about how to interpret a phylogenetic tree, the basics of how to build a tree, and appreciate phylogenetic bootstrapping and unique characters and conversion evolution. Um, this will be an introductory for some people, but I'm trying to pepper it with a few little interesting tidbits that will hopefully make it of interest to those who know this more. Uh, so um, how did evolutionary theory evolve? Well, I, I can't emphasize enough that it's, um, a, you know, it was in the context of a lot going on. There was an appreciation that the world is not constant, but changing. Plate tectonics got appreciated. We had discovery of fossils, for example, on the west coast of Africa and east coast of South America that deeper did seem to resemble each other as if those contents, continents were together. And so it was all coming together and all making sense. And they were noticing that there was these, uh, the deeper the strata, the less similar fossils were to each other. And that um, sort of, um, they were trying to deal with this issue of, is there unknown but still living species elsewhere on the planet? But the fact that they went to this deeper strata and saw it matched up with the plate tectonics made them start to realize this is maybe a, a historical record that's showing um, deeper in the strata. So in that context is where origin of the species came out, right? This landmark analysis, where a tree, um, you know, was, um, he came up with this, this idea of that organisms are derived from common ancestors by a period process of branching. This explained the fossil record, um, you know, the idea that some things were uh, classified together and that they would have um, traits inherited from a common ancestor um, and similar species in the same geographic region. And the idea was you would have this ancestral species and this concept of this branching, and then you would only see the living species, but there might be some fossil species that could be identified. So this sort of made sense. And um, since then, we've gained a lot of insight into the evolution of life. Um, 
Our Earth itself is thought to be about 4.6 billion years old. It was estimated that life on Earth occurred back as far as 4.1 billion years based on carbon isotope dating and um, fossil or microbial mat, um, yay microbes. But uh, all cellular organisms on Earth, though, are thought to share a, a last universal common ancestor or LUCA uh, dating back more than 3.8 billion years. Um, where we have a shared genetic code, amino acid chirality, you know, your right or left um, chirality. And uh, in short, um, uh, this has been the base of all the, the sort of evolution that has come. And, and what we have found, I really like this quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. We often find that if we use evolutionary theory, we can gain insights into what something is doing, why it's doing it, and what it might do in the future. And that can be very powerful in genomic epidemiology analysis where you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, uh, things like what might be happening with an infectious disease. So uh, just going to very basics, evolution, uh, one of the definitions I like the best is sort of descent with modifications. Um, basically what you have is change in some sort of heritable characteristic, um, be it in a human or in a bacteria, that is um, occurring over successive generations. You can have natural selection as the one mechanism that many people will be familiar with. Uh, we have like the Manchester moths in the sooty um, uh, Manchester uh, in the industrial age, uh, that they change from light to dark to camouflage better in the sootiness of, of Manchester during that period. Um, and then uh, you can also have what we call neutral evolution. And so just realize it's not always natural selection that's occurring. However, um, regardless, uh, these evolutionary processes give rise to biodiversity. And it's been estimated now we have over 8 million living species. Um, these microbial evolutionary processes are quite, um, you know, not as simple as you might think. It's, you know, we tend to think of it as asexual reproduction, but horizontal gene transfer, infection by phages, and that kind of mixing that can occur can really blur the boundary of species and make it uh, more complex. So more about that later. So some terminology. Um, uh, systematics is a study of the interrelationships of living things. Taxonomy is a science of naming, classifying things where evolutionary theory is not necessarily involved. You can just taxonomically assign something to, uh, to something. However, increasingly, we do like to have taxonomy match evolutionary theory. We're trying to get groups that are ancestrally related and give them a same taxa, uh, na taxonomic name. Uh, phylogenetics is a field of, of systematics that focuses on evolutionary relationships between organisms or genes or proteins, um, where we would refer to them having a phylogeny. So when we do phylogenetic analysis, it involves analysis of a set of characters. Traditionally, we were looking at morphological features, like we would look at um, primates and look at indents in their skull and features, morphological features. Um, now, in more and more, what we've realized is we can use sequence. If we look at each base or amino acid in a DNA or protein sequence, it can be an initial character, and then we line those up. We're basically looking at many, many, you know, often thousands of characters at once, and that makes for a more robust analysis. So uh, I, I want to say, though, that don't discount the value of some other features. It's not always about DNA. Um, here's an, an analysis of evolution of antlers um, that basically is, is using a combination of sequence and um, morphological features. There's your classic moose um, antler just to be a little bit Canadian here. But uh, uh, anyways, the point is that you can get um, these inferred evolutionary relationships and they're depicted usually as phylogenetic trees. Um, note the word inferred. We're always trying to imply what we think is going on. Um, and, uh, and, and note that there's several assumptions. For example, a bifurcating pattern of divergence, like a, that it's not that just, um, one species will diverge into like four at once, they'll diverge into two, and then maybe it's very quickly after that diversions into another two. That's sort of limiting because if you think about it, you could have a bunch of species together, uh, a bunch of organisms together of a species, and maybe around the periphery of that uh, that community, you could have 
one group evolving at the same time as another group is is evolving at the other side. So, but generally we assume a bifurcating pattern and um, the sequences are homologous or have shared ancestry, okay? And we talked about that a little bit before that um, you can sort of either be homologous or not. Uh, so homologous means sort of shared ancestry. Okay, so let's go over some basic phylogenetic tree terminology. So they consist of um, nodes connected by branches. The terminal nodes at the end are leaves are often called operational taxonomic units and represent the species um, for which taxa was obtained. Um, they're usually uh, the, the living species. Um, I have to say um, we have new names we tend to use sometimes in, you'll sometimes hear things like amplicon sequence variants for when we're doing uh, more um, uh, uh, metagenomic kind of analyses. But uh, I do want to just um, uh, emphasize that right now we're just going to be talking about species where there is a clear delineation of them. So uh, we're, uh, we have internal nodes re represent these hypothetical ancestral species before some sort of divergence um, event. And then the ancestor of all the sequences in a given tree is called the root. Not all trees have a root, uh, as I'll show you. <clears throat> so uh, then you, we're going to have these. Uh, Monophyletic groups or groups that have a similar phylogeny of are are of a one phylogeny that would be called a clade. So here is a one clade comprising A and B and another clade comprising uh, uh, C and D, and um, we call these sister taxa. So A and B are sister taxa, and C and D are sister taxa, and even clade one and clade two are sister taxa because they are descended from a particular node and shared node. Okay, um, the tree types you can have include a cladogram that just only shows branching order. The branch lengths don't have meaning. Um, in this case, it's just showing the order. In this uh, situation, it's showing that A and B uh, is related and then there's C that branches off. And then if this is rooted, it implies that A and B are share a common ancestor more recently than either does with C. Um, note you can do different shapes for these trees. So this tree and this tree are showing the same thing. Um, sorry, the branch lengths aren't as even as I would like there. But uh, but basically, um, this tree is just show showing it horizontally, which can be useful just for putting the names nicely and making it um, easy to see versus here, you know, you sort of have to stick them upwards or sideways a bit. Uh, it depends on what your interest is and what your, what size of tree you're showing. Um, so a uh, phylogram is the other kind of tree. Um, this has scaled branches that indicate some sort of attribute of similarity, such as a number of sequence changes. So uh, you could have, for example, this tree here um, where you have four changes on this branch and two changes on this branch and one on this and one on this. So this tree indicates that A has acquired more substitutions than B since the time they shared a common ancestor. And um, and you can you can show this as a, a uh, with a number, but you can also just have the length, right? And just show it via length. And you can have a little scale bar where you sort of, you'll see often in trees, you'll see a 0.1 and a line beside it. And that's indicating number of substitutions per site. And so when drawn vertically, the distance between any two nodes is the sum of the vertical branches. So if you want to find the distance between A and B at six, you just um, add up four and two. You're not looking at horizontal branches. That's not meaningful. If you want to look at the distance between B and C, let's see if you can think what you would do here. You would do two plus one plus one, right? Which is four, right? So um, so B and C technically is a little bit more closely related than B and A is, even though they have a shared ancestor. So uh, when when drawn horizontally, the distance of those two nodes is some of the horizontal branches. So just picture that tree shifted over sideways. Um, again, it's the the these these branches here are just to separate things out to make it easier to see. Okay, so you can do this kind of tree orientation. Like I said, there's the sort of vertical and horizontal, vertical or horizontal, I guess, and vertical. So you can trees can be drawn vertically or horizontally. 
You can also rotate the branches of a tree. Think of the, a mobile like this, where you can sort of have things move around. So this can spin right here, this could spin right here, and these are all the same tree, okay? So you can, this can say C and D here, or it can be C and D the other, this could be D and this could be C, that would be the same thing. What you can't do is move something around such that A is sort of connecting somehow here or here, right? So there is limits to what you can do, but you can rotate them, but you still have to maintain the same um, branching order. Okay. Uh, note the benefits of unscaled versus scaled branches. Here's semi coli BTEC um, phylogenetic analysis, um, where it's got, you know, clearly they're very evenly drawn, implying it's unscaled branches. And sure, certainly you can look at methods and confirm. But uh, this tells you nicely the branching order. But notice if you actually look at this with branching order, uh, with um, the scaled branches, Look at how this pops out. This clearly, this ED666 uh, and ED657 are quite um, divergent versus the rest of them. And in fact, these guys look so identical, you can't even really see what's going on here. So what you can do is you can actually add a little branch. And so here's a, a scale bar showing sort of number of substitutions and dist a distance measure. And then you can just stick in a little thing here just to sit, sort of point out that these guys are essentially identical, but they, you know, you're trying to show, um, uh, you know, maybe a slight uh, a change there. So in short, um, you can do sort of scaled uh, often to just sort of see what's going on, but sometimes um, unscaled is very valuable just to get a, a feel for branching order. Okay. Um, for rooted trees, um, the root is again the ancestor of all the sequences. A tree with a root shows that order of descent. So it's very powerful because it really shows you that A branched off, then B branched off, then C and D um, of, uh, diverge from each other. Okay. Um, and uh, this tree is an example of one that has no root. It's not the best branched out, it should be more like a cordyphlex snowflake or star phylogeny. Um, and uh, this this tree, though, what's important about this is an unrooted tree doesn't really show the direction of evolution. It's less informative. You don't know if the root is over here or if it's even here or if it's even here, you know, which diverged off first, right? It's often drawn in uh, what we call radial format. But when you start adding a root, you can get a lot more information. So for example, you can have this tree that's unrooted and you can say, um, uh, or sorry, I should step back, sorry. Um, you can actually take a tree where you don't know um, the order and you can say, okay, I'm gonna add an outgroup or basically a species that we're pretty sure is ancestral to everything else. So for example, if you're looking at some mammals, you might use a, ver a sequence from a non-mammal vertebrate like a zebrafish as an outgroup. You know that zebrafish diverged before um, from these mammals before these other mammals, so you can use that. You root it, and basically you put that at the base of the tree, and then you draw the rest of the tree from that. And so you can see here that zebrafish diverged, then cow diverged, and human and chimp are, are more similar to each other, not surprisingly. Okay, so it's often possible to place the root by including an outgroup, uh, that, oh, sorry, um, adding an outgroup like in a, um, a bacterial species. Uh, for example, uh, in here, you might have, you're interested in some E. coli relationships of figuring out how E. coli 12, K12 used in labs relates to 01104 or 0157 um, pathogenic E. coli. And you might want to add a root by saying, okay, I'm going to add Salmonella typhimurium that you know is an outgroup. Um, and so then you can see here that K12 is more related to 0104 than it is to 0157 in terms of um, when it, its most recent ancestor, okay? Or are closely related um, uh, uh, other species. So the main point is that you can use this to basically, and, and I encourage that, that often when you're doing a tree, you wanna include an outgroup. However, you have to be very careful you don't use too divergent an outgroup 
because then the alignment isn't so good because the sequence is so divergent. So you want to sort of try to pick something that is as closely related to what you're looking at as you can. Okay, um, so here's another example. You've got human, gorilla, and chimp, and you want to know which is more related. Again, uh, you can add an outgroup of a non primate species, and you can see that human and chimpanzee are more related than they are to gorilla. Okay. Um, so let's just look at a tree ourselves and see, uh, you know, what does this tree tell you? Um, do you see anything um, notable about this? What do you, what's your first impressions about this? So I'll give you a sec to just sort of look at this and reflect and see what do you think is going on here? These are just um, uh, labeling some uh, branches here with A, B, C, D, and C just to label them just because I'm going to talk about them. Okay. So uh, first thing you should notice is the branches are differing in length. So it's likely a phylogram. It appears to be rooted because it has a line, but I want to put a cautionary note that many soft, um, soft uh, phylogenetic drawing packages will tend to sort of stick a, no, um, a branch in there, but it's not necessarily rooted. So you need to always check and see if this is actually a rooted tree or not. But uh, here's, um, this is implying the mouse lineage, you'll notice is very long, implying it has undergone some sort of accelerated evolution. And in fact, that's true. Mice have un undergone a, a more divergence, more rapid divergence than humans since their last common ancestor. This node here would be the common ancestor of mice and humans. And this would be the common ancestor of mice, human, and cattle. And uh, it's actually true and fun fact that we actually do share more sequence similarity with cows versus mice on average because of their accelerated evolution. But we still study mice a lot because of that common ancestry and common functions. But, you know, be aware that it, it actually isn't just a question of that the one that's um, most similar to you is the one that's um, and uh, share, has the most um, closest shared ancestry. Uh, that said, this tree is drawn with a bit of exaggeration um, to sort of make the point. Okay, here's another example. So take a look at this tree and see which node you think represents the probable ancestor of North American bears. So you've got South American bears here, you've got Asian bears, you've got the North American bears. So look at that and see if you can figure out yourself which node you think is the um, node that represents the ancestor of North American bears. I can say that the ancestor of all of the bears seems to be this node A. There's an ancestor of Asian bears is this node uh, D. Um, this ancestor of these Asian and North American bears is B and C would be the ancestor of these North American bears. So the answer is C, okay? Um, so these uh, North American bears, you'll see you've got this kind of relationship between the polar bears and the brown bears uh, being a bit more uh, related than the American black bear, which does make sense. These guys, you definitely don't want to be around these guys. They're uh, a little meaner than your African black bear. Okay, uh, so how do we build a tree? Okay, so what I want to do here is just go through a sort of a, a crash course on and give you a sense of how you build a tree. Certainly encourage taking a proper course to learn about this. But um, but basically building a tree requires, number one, you have to have a multiple sequence alignment. You don't just build a tree from your sequences. You have to do an alignment. What you're doing is you're aligning your sequences uh, into columns. And the sole purpose of that is to place homologous or shared ancestry positions of homologous sequences in the same column. Can't emphasize that enough. If you've got a sequence that you stick with your set of sequences that you want to build a tree with that is not homologous, just um, just by chance has some sequence similarity, that is not assume these methods are not assuming that and it's going to muck things up. You're going to get this really long branch if it's too divergent and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, you're really trying to say that these are this is basically a homologous position, okay? And so. Um, what it's doing then is it's looking at these comparatively, this multiple sequence alignment using a model of evolution and some sort of tree building algorithm. And I'll go through that in a second. Um, but really the goal is to identify the tree that best describes the data given a certain model of evolution that's uh, used. So again, four steps, 
you're constructing always a multiple sequence alignment first from usually good quality sequences with contextual data. Because you know what? If you do a tree and you've got no data on the leaves of those trees, like what the, the species is, what the gene name is, what any kind of phenotypes associated with that particular thing, it's really not very useful, right? So the contextual data is key. So then um, we can uh, we want to look at what uh, model of evolution you might want to use. Learn about that in a second. Then you're going to build the tree and then evaluate the tree. Okay. So there's two main um, tree building methods. There's distance-based methods, which basically um, convert the sequence data into just saying, okay, this whole sequence has this kind of level of distance, so this whole other sequence, or character-based, which actually uses the each individual. Um, aligned um, nucleotide or amino acid, depending on what you're doing. Okay, so distance matrix, um, distance methods use a um, a tree based on a distance matrix built using a multiple sequence alignment. Um, basically, for example, here's a bunch of sequences, A, B, C, and D sequences. Um, we can literally just count how many differences there is here, right? And so, for example, um, between uh, D and C here, you can see uh, D, uh, D is here and C is here, and it has two changes, right, showing up there. Um, if you look at between A and D, uh, it's got a lot more changes, and if you count up those differences, it's five. And this is the most uh, simplistic way to look at it, um, basically unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean. Um, also neighbor joining, which I'll mention, is which is pretty popular because in general, it'll give you a pretty fast rough tree, which is not too bad. So um, distance mace, mace, uh, methods though, um, one thing I want you to appreciate is a tree that exactly fits this kind of matrix often doesn't exist. The distance have to satisfy a bunch of mathematical properties. So we wanna find the tree that most closely matches this matrix and finding that tree with the best foot fit turns out to be an MP complete problem or basically um, computationally um, a problem. So we need heuristic or approximate methods to basically um, come up with this, what this tree is. So um, neighbor joining is one example of one. It's a heuristic method that basically at each step um, joins these two closest uh, subtrees that are not already joined. So it basically starts with what they call a star phylogeny or sort of unresolved tree. So you've got all these sequences and basically you, you make a Q matrix um, calculated from the original distance matrix to look at the average distance from each node to all other nodes. And you're basically, what you're doing is joining um, those that are most similar. Uh, uh, and then you're saying, okay, these two are most similar. I'm gonna join that together. And then I'm gonna see, consider that one and this one, and I'm going to see if these two should be joined together or if it's these two should be joined together next or whatever. And you do this repeatedly uh, um, until the tree is fully resolved and you end up with a tree like something like this. Um, again, um, this is, uh, you know, you can root this to make it better, but it's generally the default is, of course, an unrooted tree with branch lengths where it's just trying to show the branching order of these. Um, and uh, this, again, you can use an outgroup to root it. It won't necessarily find the optimal tree and it only ever outputs one tree. There's other methods like maximum parsimony that will give you if you have more than one parsimonious tree. However, you know, really testing is shown. This works pretty well and it's relatively fast. So it's pretty popular. Um, however, I would say character-based methods have really taken off. Um, uh, also called discrete methods, they operate on sequences rather than the distances. The two major um, character methods are maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood. Um, maximum parsimony involves finding the tree, sorry, I gotta get rid of that noise, um, involves finding the tree that best describes the sequences using the fewest evolutionary steps. Note that it can find, um, you know, uh, sorry, um, but, sorry, ma maximum parsimony, sorry, got distracted by those noises. So there's two main character methods. There's maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood. Maximum parsimony involves finding that tree using the fewest evolutionary steps, and it can find the most parsimonious tree. 
Oh dear, I'm gonna have to get rid of that. Um, uh, shoot. Um, uh, so uh, maximum likelihood involves finding the tree that is most likely to have produced the data given a model of evolution. It's very popular since like character-based methods, it uses all the data, not reducing sequences down like neighbor joining to dis distance, and it gives you a nice probability of your tree. So you've got a sense of, of um, its likelihood. Okay, so, um, so again, this is finding the probability of observing the data. Um, it requires a, a model of sequence evolution, a tree, and the observed data. In other words, given the data D, and a model M, find the tree T, such as this probability of this um, this data is um, is maximized. I have to say this requires examining all the columns of sequence and searching through all the possible trees. So it is more computationally intensive. I'll walk you through that a little bit here. Uh, so for example, um, you have uh, you know, an evolutionary model, for example, of, oh, that should be just arrows here. Um, so in transitions, you remember, are interchange of purines um, or uh, pyrimidines. Transversions are where you have a more significant change. Sorry, I've got to figure out how to um, um, mute. No, no. Oh, no. Okay. Um, so uh, so basically, um, you have transitions and transversions. And if you remember, transversions are a little more significant to change. And there are actually twice as, more, as many possible transversions, but they really aren't favored because they're a much more significant change. So transitions are generated at higher um, frequency in general, OK? Um, so uh, basically, we're going to use that model and consider the following four sequences, okay, in a in a and a tree. So we're saying, okay, with this sequence, this data, and we're going to look at position one in that sequence. Given this tree, for example, and a particular model of evolution that says the transitions uh, probability transition is 0.3, and um, for transversions it's 0.1. And uh, and you could have no, no change might be 0. 0.6 or something. So we're basically going to say, OK, what is the probability of that? Uh, we can calculate the probability of that tree for every possible reconstruction of ancestral sites x and y, OK? Because you've got these different possibilities of trees here. In other words, we set x and y to be um, g, a, t, or c. And then we're going to see. Um, uh, basically, we're going to calculate 16 values, and we're going to find what is the probability at this just this one position, given this tree and a model of evolution. Okay, that's just that one thing we're doing. Now, what we're going to do is uh, uh, is uh, we can calculate this the 16 values, basically determine the probability of that column given that tree and that model. Okay, in other positions. We can do it in the same manner. So we can do that for the first position. We can do that for the second position. Again, we're looking at those um, ancestral X and Y possibilities, and we're looking at, uh, and, and we can do this. And basically, we get the likelihood of this particular tree and need to look at all three to find out which gives the largest value, Okay, which is the most uh, likely possibility of these uh, three possible trees. So this, it, I guess, in a nutshell, I'm going through this pretty fast, but in a nutshell, the main thing to appreciate is this requires searching through many possible trees, very computationally intensive. Um, the evolutionary model, though I'll just add aside, can include time. This means considering each topology and branch lengths for each topology. But, uh, and, and I want to caution, you know, the result of this is dependent on your model of evolution. So you have to sort of look at that. But Main thing I want you to appreciate is that that method has really taken off because it does give you a probability. It is pretty robust. And um, I would say that and uh, Bayesian approaches have really taken off. I'm not going to go into Bayesian approaches except to say it applies Bayes theorem, which, which looks at probability distribution for a bunch of parameters of interest, um, has the ability to incorporate prior information for events, like a prior distribution for outbreak onset time, 
Um, there, you're going to be talking more about uh, Bayesian approaches and time trees and the phylogenetics course module that's coming up uh, later. So I'm not going to go into that right now. I do want to just briefly mention that, that there are recombination aware approaches and remember that recombination invalidates most. So if you are looking at a virus and there's recombination that occurs, for example, that's happened with SARS-CoV-2, um, you can get, uh, you really have to sort of look at that recombined virus and all its descendants as one tree. You can't sort of put uh, recombined uh, viruses together in, in one tree. However, there are recombination aware approaches that have been developed and uh, key messages it's important to detect possible recombination before performing a phylogenetic analysis because of this issue of, of it invalidating your method. Um, you can also do cool uh, methods like ultrafast placement on existing trees or usher uh, sample placement. Um, and um, basically, in short, uh, this enables very rapid SARS-CoV-2 analysis, placing a sample on a very large tree. It's very, very cool. Okay, so what is the best tree building method after I mentioned all this? Well, there's no single best method. It depends a little bit on the size and complexity of your data set. Um, you know, obviously, if you've got, you know, millions of sequences, uh, you're not going to be able to do a very computationally time intensive method. Um, the speed of your computing resources can matter. Why you want to perform the analysis, you know, are you just trying to look at a couple of sequences? Oh, my God, I'm going to go insane here. Um, uh, so, uh, so basically, we want to um, identify the, uh, the best uh, model usually when you're doing it and look at what what kind of computing resources you have and what size of data set you have. Um, here's um, J model test, which can look at different models. Um, but usually I find that people have worked out a particular model. So if you're new to this, often you can be um, following what other people have found as a good model for that particular uh, species in that particular application. Um, another consideration um, I want you to have is the idea of protein versus RNA and DNA analysis, that RNA and DNA have more informative sites. Um, RNA and DNA are better for um, uh, study of very highly related sequences. So if you're looking at um, SARS-CoV-2 recent um, evolution, you would be wanting to look at um, you know, nucleotide sequences. However, if you're doing more divergent sequences, maybe you're looking at a bunch of transporter proteins, um, you know, you could look at the genes, but if they're too divergent, it starts to get messy. And sometimes it's better for, uh, you know, to use a protein-based analysis because it has more different characters. You've only got four different characters, G, A, T, C, for your RNA or DNA protein. You have more different characters. It is better for study of more distantly related sequences and it has less bias from codon usage, for example, if you're doing a coding region than for, say, DNA. Okay, so um, uh, for aiding and doing an analysis, and then we're going to sort of start to get to the, the more interesting part, I think, um, is, um, is tree evaluation. So one of the things to aid in doing tree eval evaluation is bootstrapping. So bootstrapping basically tests whether the whole data set is supporting the tree, or if a tree is just a slight winner among nearly equal alternatives. So I'll walk you through this a bit. Uh, so basically you would have a, um, a multiple sequence alignment. So I'm just dealing with a little icon in the way here. Okay, um, so you have multiple sequence alignments that, um, uh, that this is the original data, right? Where you've got this GGCC and GGAT and ACTT for these sequences A, B, and C. And you can use that to make a tree. As you can see, probably that um, this A sequence is a bit more divergent than the B and C. The B and C share these Gs, so it tends it has uh, um, you know quite a bit of uh, more similarity. But what you can do then is you can do a bootstrap replicate where you basically randomly slightly perturb the original data set, such as random sampling of some columns and replacement. Um, in this case, you'll see that uh, you know, instead of GGCC, you see it's GGCG. And so it's just done this little bit of a replacement and it's seeing how does the tree show up in that case? In that case, it doesn't actually change the tree. It's still A, B, and C is the order. 
However, if you do a bootstrap rep replicate um, where you're changing um, from uh, ACTT to um, CATA, for example, um, uh, you'll notice that that is uh, resulting in a change in the in the branching order. Um, in this case, you do it again, and it's not resulting in a change. And you'll see that basically, when you did these replicates, two out of three times it showed up as being this one tree. So what you can do is you can go back to your original data and say, okay, 66% of the time I saw this particular branching order. I'm going to put a 66 here because that's actually the main branch. This is actually just one branch showing off with just one um, node here. And so I'm going to say 66% of the time this branching order occurred. Okay. So again, um, the original tree is labeled at the cluster at a node of, of a cluster with numbers indicating how often that cluster occurs. Um, made from um, replicates of a tree or a consensus tree can be built and labeled as well. Uh, bootstrap values of generally over 70% is considered good support for a given cluster, but of course, you know, it's uh, it's really sort of an arbitrary cutoff. But uh, note due to random perturbation, though, each time you bootstrap, you can get different branching orders for branches with lower support. So you might uh, do a tree with uh, 100 bootstraps, you do it 100 times and you get a tree. And then you might do it again, another 100 bootstraps, and you might actually get a slightly different tree just because of the randomness of that. But the overall um, sense you should get is you should get a sense of what's happening in your tree. So here, for example, we see 100 times at a bootstrap values of 100, 100 times out of 100 that this, um, you know, uh, branched off here and these branched off here. You can be pretty, pretty confident about this. But here there's a 41 here. So that tells you that we really don't know what the branching order is there versus say here. It could be that this sequence sometimes branches with these guys. It could be that these two branch together sometimes. If you see this 41, this 31 and 29, you just don't know um, uh, what is, very confidently what's happening. You do know that generally these guys are sort of coming out and you do know confidently that this is, for example, a separate clade because 100% of the time you got that as a separate one. You know, this is a separate clade, this is a separate clade, this is a separate clade, but you don't really have a good sense of what's going on with these guys, for example. Okay, so uh, again, um, I just want to emphasize these high bootstrap values provide support, but as long as the multiple sequence alignment is robust, if you add in a sequence, that is really divergent from your set of sequences, it will show you 100% long bootstrap value, you know, and that's great, but it can be misleading if you don't have a good alignment. Um, it can show, it can imply something is more divergent, for example, if you don't align it very well um, than it truly is. Okay, um, also useful, I find this very, very useful actually, is I find often we don't look enough at unique characters versus what we call homoplasy. So unique characters are basically any kind of character in a sequence that has occurred once and is unreversed. Um, examples in animals are, you know, fur, for example, or feathers and birds. So if you go into the Amazon and you see an animal with fur, you know instantly that that is a mammal. If you see an animal with feathers, you know it's a bird, right? So it's very useful for getting a sense of where that particular organism or gene or protein is and what its um, relationship might be with others. Um, as a general epidemiology example, you can also use it to provide further support for inferring relationships. For example, you find an indel or what we, the short version we call an insertion and deletion of a character. Um, you find it only in sequences associated with an outbreak in a certain ge geographic region. Phylogeny suggests that a new sequence of interest elsewhere um, is closely related, may have originated from that location. The new sequence, you know, is from elsewhere, but it's sort of branching with the others. Um, if that new sequence also contains that unique indel found in that outbreak group, um, it sort of further supports the phylogeny and gives you a bit of um, um, more, uh, you know, robust support. Okay. Um, also really useful is identifying convergent evolution. I would say that's maybe even more useful because uh, basically strong selective pressure 
can enable mutations leading to, um, for example, increased antimicrobial re um, resistant, antimicrobial drug resistance, or other beneficial adaptions in pathogens. You can get immune evasive mutations, for example. And these, these kind of mutations, because they're so beneficial, they can occur multiple times independently in evolution um, in lineages. So basically, in short, when you see a particular mutation occurring frequently, independently in different um, lineages, uh, take notice because that probably indicates some sort of functional advantage. Um, one of my favorite examples of conversion evolution is um, all our wonderful um, mammals that went back into the water. So we've got like some ancestor of a, a canine that went back into the water and became a, a walrus, uh, you know, a, an ancestor of, it's not, not actually an elephant, an ancestor of the elephant and manatee that went back into the water and became a manatee. And of course, the um, ancestor of some ruminants uh, that uh, went back into uh, the water and became dolphins and whales or cetaceans. So uh, this kind of fluke or concept of a tail fluke is a character that has evolved multiple times independently in different mammalian um, in different marine mammals, they look somewhat similar, but they have independently occurred and it indicates obviously there's a functional advantage to developing that tail fluke if you're gonna become a marine mammal. Okay, um, uh, an example uh, that we keep seeing over and over again with SARS-CoV-2, where I do tracking of variants for this um, Duotang uh, for Covernet, uh, a coronavirus uh, variants rapid response network. Um, so we basically can look at for mutations that are repeatedly occurring. And a classic example is in the spike of the protein, you can have changes from um, arginine or R346T to T. And this change from R to T at position 346 is usually written as S colon R346T. And that kind of mutation has been occurring independently over and over again. You can see in red here, sorry if you're not if you're colorblind, but hopefully you can still see that here and 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 here. We keep seeing that mutation occurring independently in different lineages, implying a function of a functional benefit. And sure enough, it's a helps with immune evasion. Um, interestingly, we saw this happen with this uh, particular um, um, evolution leading to the BQ variants. Um, now, currently, we had this new JN1 variant that took off in January, and now we're seeing again, this JN1 variant didn't have, oh, that's supposed to say 346, sorry. Um, that that JN1 variant didn't have 346T, and sure enough, we're seeing 346T containing variants independently occurring over and over again as it um, gains that additional um, innovation right now. Okay, so um, also useful is identifying orthologs, paralogs, and xenologs. And then I'll just uh, stop for a second and see if anybody has any uh, questions. I guess I can go on the uh, Slack too, uh, with apologies again for that noise. Um, uh, bear with me here for a second. And... Uh, Okay, so I'm there if anybody has any um, uh, questions. So uh, basically, um, uh, you know, you're always wanting to figure out if something is homologous or not. Often it's determined by some sort of arbitrary threshold of similarity determined by alignment coupled with any kind of functional information or position in the genome, for example. But once you get these I figure out that something's homologous, it's very helpful to find out if it's orthologous. Uh, Will Sow already mentioned this in the opening lecture. That's where genes are produced by speciation. They're of interest because they tend to have similar function. They're basically the same gene in two different species. So usually we're very interested in finding orthologs, particularly if you want to look at the, uh, you, you know, say the function of some E. coli genes because they've been really well studied and you want to find, you find the ortholog in another bacteria, you want to learn more about what that is doing, um, or you see, for example, it's undergoing accelerated evolution, you want to see what that gene function is, you can sort of predict function that way. Um, so a common way to infer ortholog is the gene tree matches the species tree. 
Um, there's a, a rough way to do it, reciprocal best blast analysis. However, that kind of, that's where you take a sequence and you take a gene in a genome and you blast it against um, another genome that you want to find the ortholog in. And you find the top hit and then you take that top hit and you blast it back to the original genome and see if that top hit is the top hit back. And if reciprocally, they're both the top hit of each other, both most similar to each other, we can roughly say those are ortholog. Unfortunately, it doesn't work all the time. Um, you can have problems with gene loss and gene duplications that can complicate that. But uh, generally, certainly that does get used a lot. But uh, often the more robust way to, to look at it is a gene tree matches a species tree. So more about that later when we do some a um, uh, bit more interactive stuff. Okay, so for paralogs, um, those are homologs produced by gene duplication. They tend to have differing functions because if you think about it, it doesn't tend to make sense to have two copies of a gene doing exact same thing. Uh, they have different functions at some level. So it could be, for example, that you have some transporters, genes, and they're both transporters, but there's been a gene duplication such that one transports arginine and one transports another positively charged amino acid. And you uh, get sort of divergence of these because they're saying maybe me, you know, instead of a transporter just transporting positively charged amino acids, maybe it's more specific to particular amino acids, these two paralogs that might occur. So in short, um, they tend to have differing functions and a common way you infer them literally is you see multiple copies in the same species. Um, and uh, and the, where the positioning of those are, excuse me, in the genome. But uh, the other one that we get very interested in in, in micro microbial analysis and genomic epidemiology is xenologs or homologs resulting from horizontal gene transfer. Those are really interesting because they tend to, again, this is the word, I italicized the word tend for a reason, not an average, impart some sort of novel adaptive functionality to the recipient organism. So for example, way back when there, when there was a, an outbreak of um, strep pneumo um, in town, and there was a new genomic island that was showing up of like something that had been horizontally transferred in. There was an interest in, should we do more, um, uh, you know, aggressive uh, vaccination program to try to nip that in the bud and avoid um, any problems if that particular um, streptococcus pneumoniae has a um, a new feature, new adaptive functionality that actually looked a bit like caps. It had stra um, uh, polysaccharide genes as if it might make some capsule changes. So uh, that's an example of why we sort of tend to care about that. Um, they tend to be, um, uh, these horizontally transferred regions tend to also disproportionately encode uh, virulence factors and other kinds of adaptations, metal resistance, um, solvent resistance, that kind of thing. So a common way to infer this is a gene tree doesn't match the species tree um, where the rest of the gene tree um, does match. Uh, so that, that gene location is in a really odd position in terms of what you would expect for the phylogeny of these organisms. So always remember when you're looking at orthologs, paralogs, and xenologs in a tree, you need to sort of know the species tree or the corresponding kind of organismal tree associated with that. Um, you uh, obviously can ID a sort of novel genomic insertion like a phage or a genomic island. That would be another way to identify uh, xenologs. Okay, so uh, before I get to that concluding comments and check for questions, uh, I want to emphasize here that it's also useful to identify um, in paralogs and out paralogs. And so just, there is another level of complexity that you can do. So you can refer to paralogs in the context of a species relationship, like, um, for example, in paralogs are, are duplication after species divergence versus out paralogs are duplication before species divergence. So let's look at this, for example. These guys, um, uh, we're looking at this, we're looking at, uh, say, this is a human and mouse. And uh, you see a human, a mouse, two human and mice genes, and this divergence matches what you might expect for the divergence of the species. Um, you would say that this is a speciation event, and you would say these guys are orthologs. 
you get two copies of a gene here. So you sort of instantly flags. There's two copies here. So those are paralogs. And we would say those are in paralogs because relative to the mouse that we're looking at, if we're looking at human and mice comparison, then um, this is something that occurred after those species diverged. So we're going to call them in paralogs in that context. Um, out paralogs would be, um, you know, these more divergent genes, like for example, a whole transporter gene family. Uh, so you might have, um, and you can have within species out paralogs or between species out paralogs. Generally, out paralogs aren't really of interest. They're sort of like these large gene families, um, uh, like for example, transporters. Um, note that selective gene loss in these large gene families can be a complicated analysis, and you have to always remember that there might have been gene loss occurring in these um, families. Uh, in paralogs, they are much more of an interest, um, like you could have a recent duplication of some nice serial opacity genes in a lineage as part of its ongoing evolving immune evasion. But uh, one thing I do want to emphasize here is that it can help with identifying function. So these two genes, they're sort of generally pretty similar. So we're going to sort of say, okay, those are um, likely orthologs. They likely probably have the same function in these two different organisms. But here, You've got the mouse and you've got two copies of the human gene. So it's less clear what the function is of H1 and H3 here. Um, they could have, it could be H1 maintained this, this, the, the function of M1 or H3 maintained the function of M1 or both of them diverged a bit. Uh, you know, so it's hard to say without functional analysis, but it's good to flag that. And in fact, I've seen this kind of thing happen before where somebody spends ages looking at the ortholog of a particular gene in their species and studying in depth and realizing if they'd just done this kind of analysis, they would have seen that actually there was a risk that this was not the true ortholog and maybe wasn't really representative of their original organism. So um, concluding comments before I open up to, to questions and we're gonna do this interactive session after. Um, so I want to emphasize, again, that phylogenetic inference allows us to estimate or infer evolutionary relationships. Uh, there's a famous quote that, you know, looking at this kind of evolution, it's something fundamentally, looking at history is fundamentally impossible, but necessary and highly important. So whenever we're looking at history, we can't know often exactly what's happened, but we can you often learn um, some things about what's happened. And uh, this often significantly um, aids in function prediction if you know how to interpret trees, uh, but you can sort of infer things and gain hypotheses. Data quality is paramount. Uh, again, having that good quality uh, sequence, good quality contextual data, good quality multiple sequence alignment, and you've got like a nice model um, for what you're doing, okay? Um, we have covered the basics of terminology and, and things that there are more complicated methods to deal with genome, genomic size data, but don't discount the value of sort of smaller scale analyses of a particular set of genes. A reminder, though, that phylogeny is best interpreted when you have that contextual data, like having the geography, patient information, some gene function info. I'll have more about that after the break.